Exodus 34, verse 22, celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. Okay, so we're going to talk about the festival of weeks. We are actually going to be entering into the second Passover. Not everyone is required to enter into the second Passover. In fact, I won't be eating unleavened bread and doing all of that again, but I will be walking through it with those who are entering into the second Passover. And the reason why is because I'm not required to do that again. I do not feel God putting it on my heart to go through eating the lamb and then doing the um, eating the unleavened bread. But if he does, then that's what I'm going to do. What I will be doing is I will be supporting those who are entering into Passover for the first time or those who missed the first Passover and would like to enter into the second Passover, that second chance that God has extended. And I want you to remember that this is a that Passover represents God extending the covenant. Christ died on Passover. He extended the covenant on Passover. He is the Passover lamb. It's a very, very important holy day. All of God's holy days are important, but this should really mean something to us because it represents the extension of the covenant. It represents the invitation for us to enter in with him and receive salvation and to become who we're supposed to become in order to be with the Lord forever. That should mean something to us. And so I'm really grateful that there are some people who want to enter into that. And I'm also grateful for those on those here on the channel who want to show up for the body of Christ, want to show up and support those who are entering into this. I mean, for the first time, that should be really, really, it's to, for me, it's a blessing. It's exciting. I'm rejoicing that there are people who want to please God in this way, who want to do what he has commanded. Now there's a mention of the festival of ingathering and we don't typically refer to the festival of tabernacles as the festival of ingathering, but the word does use it interchangeably. And so I want you to build that into your repertoire. If you're keeping a key, you know, a lot of times um, during the Bible study, I, I encourage everyone to keep a key because we're reading through Revelation and there's so much symbolism that after a while you can get kind of jumbled up with, wait, what is the sea again? The sea is multitudes, peoples, languages, and nations, right? So that can get a little cumbersome. So when you're reading scripture, I encourage you to keep a key. It might even be a good idea to keep it on your computer so that you can just do a search, you know, whenever you need to find that rather than trying to, you know, switch to a paper uh, where you've got to kind of like review the paper because act after a while you are going to have a lot of concepts written down. So it might be easy. I don't know. On my computer, I have a Mac. So if I do Command F, then I'm able to type in whatever it is that I want. I'm sure that other computers have some sort of search function where you can, you know, search for a word in your document. I'm not a techie person. That's all I know. So Festival of Ingathering is the same as Festival of Tabernacles. Now, God also mentions three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. And those three times a year, this is the pilgrimage. Sometimes it's referred to as the Moadim. Again, when we start adding other languages, it can get a little bit tricky. I don't want for you to get confused and start thinking that I'm talking, that I'm speaking in terms of you need to be using the Hebrew word. Not really. Pilgrimage is sufficient. Um, and as long as you understand that God has required three pilgrimage festivals in which Jews went to the temple. And in so doing, they were required to go through certain cleansing rituals in order to make themselves ready to enter into those festivals. And so I talk with you about that. You, you too need to be making yourself ready to enter into those festivals. And if they were doing cleansing rituals, and we don't do those anymore, we don't necessarily do cleansing rituals or, or sacrificing a red heifer, for example, in order to make ourselves clean from being around a dead body, but we do examine ourselves, we engage in repentance, we lay our hearts bare before God. These are the ways that we make ourselves clean and we receive what he wants to cleanse out of us or build in us or minister to us. So three times a year, pilgrimage festivals, these are Passover, 
the Festival of Weeks, and the Festival of Tabernacles, also referred to as the Festival of Ingathering, which is at the turn of the year. Now, it's at the turn of the year because even though it's at the seventh month, that's we would think turn of the year, okay, well, that's the 12th month in Adar, right? But actually, he's saying the turn of the year because his harvest days, his harvest festivals revolve around harvest. And so that's the last harvest of the year. There's the spring harvest, summer, and then there's uh, autumn. He does not, in, in during the summertime, he does not talk about any, in none of his uh, festivals revolve around summertime. They revolve around spring, and the which is the early harvest, and then autumn, which is the late harvest. Now, in the, the same thing happens in the resurrection. He, uh, Paul talks about those who are going to be first fruits, those who will be harvested first. The, these are the witnesses, prophets, servants of God, the apostles. And then there is a late harvest, those who will be harvested after. And these are the multitude in white robes. The reason I don't want you to get caught up on using Hebrew terms like Moadim and things like this is because then you start looking them up and you leave yourself vulnerable to looking things up in Reform Judaism and receiving things from people who call themselves rabbi and even messianic rabbi. What in the world is that if the Messiah said, do not call yourself rabbi? Now you now because you call yourself messianic rabbi, that's better? No. No bueno. We're told not to do it. Anyone who does it is not of him. So be very careful about that. There's so much filth and garbage in Reform Judaism, and there are certain people who call themselves Christian who teach that nonsense. It's the same thing as ingesting counterfeit Christianity and then regurgitating that. Same thing. It's just falsehood, counterfeit. But you need to be aware of that and you need not go there. Let's start now at Leviticus 23 verse 9. So Passover, the word, he's already talked about Passover. He's talked about his Sabbaths. Now God is talking about the offering of first fruits. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm give, going to give you and reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Okay, so understand what he's saying. When you get to the land, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest. Passover represented the, the night the Israelites left. They escaped bondage on that night of Passover. Remember that they were told to tuck their cloak into their belt and have their staff ready and to eat it in haste because they're leaving, it, they're leaving Egypt in haste. And that's exactly what happened. They put the blood of the lamb over the door. They sacrificed the lamb, put the blood over the of the lamb over their door, roasted it with herbs, bitter herbs. They had cleansed their house of yeast, made unleavened bread, Bread without yeast representing Christ without sin. God sends the destroying angel into Egypt, takes the firstborn of every household, except of the households that have the blood of the lamb over their door. So what's that representing? It's representing Christ. It's representing the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is in you, then you have his name on your right hand and on your forehead when he returns. But you could have the Holy Spirit in you right now and then have that go away because you didn't pick it up, because you didn't take up your covenant, because you were spurning him. Same way that happened with Saul, his position was removed. God's spirit was removed and it was replaced with a tormenting spirit. So don't get too comfy. This calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people. You see that multiple times in scripture. You've got to endure till the end and you've got to fan into flame God's Holy Spirit. So the Israelites left Egypt on that night. That's when Pharaoh came and he said, get out, go worship your God. So they packed it up and they left. That's why God is referring to when you enter the land, I'm going to give you. There's other language that he uses here, such as the offering of first fruits. That is kind of peculiar to us. What's first fruits? What are we talking about here? Christ is described as the first fruits. 
and the witnesses and the apostles are also described as first fruits. And the reason they're described as first fruits is because first fruits are the first of the harvest. It's that awesome bumper crop that you get when everything first starts coming in. As one who gardens, it is such an exciting time because you're li- the plants are just lush and beautiful. Those little blossoms are coming in, then it turns to fruit and you can ki- you can see your harvest coming in. And so when it does come in, it's so exciting and it's the best of the crop. That's the first fruits. So for God to refer to his son that way, for him to refer to the witnesses and the apostles that way is quite the honor. That early harvest and the bumper crop, the cream of the crop, as they say. But I want you to notice here that the priest is to wave the first grain that's brought. So they bring a sheaf of the first grain of their harvest. The priest, Jesus is our high priest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on our behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. I'm going to explain to you which Sabbath he's talking about. What you need to understand here is that throughout the word, God talks about acceptable sacrifices, acceptable offerings, and unacceptable sacrifices. Not every sacrifice is accepted by the Lord. So you need to make sure that you are an acceptable sacrifice so that you will be accepted by him. Another way that the word talks about this is what's going to be to your credit and what will not be to your credit. So the word will delineate between certain things. This is going to be to your credit. I desire that this be to your credit. Remember Paul said that to, uh, was it the people in Corinth or Ephesus? I can't remember. They'd taken up a collection for him. Don't mistake it with tithing. Tithing was fulfilled. They took up a collection to help him and he was so touched and he said, you know, it's not that God doesn't provide for my needs, but I desire what? I desire that this be to your credit. Elsewhere in scripture, God says this will not be to your credit. Cain provided an offering that was not to his credit. His offering was provided with a wicked heart. It was unacceptable before God. So remember that you got to settle that matter between you and God. What is acceptable? lay your heart bare before him. The other thing that the word says is God doesn't really need anything from you. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, everything in the earth is his. What does he actually need from us? What do we actually have to offer him? Does he need our money? Does he need our fruit and plants? Does he need animal sacrifices? He doesn't need anything from us. What he desires is our heart. And so the way that we offer ourselves, we can't possibly even know what we're going to offer him, where he's going to move us in order to fulfill this covenant. We really don't know. And as a matter of fact, we don't even know that from just reading the word. We have to receive that from his spirit. And the only way for us to receive that is to submit to him, to lay ourselves bare to be changed, and then he's going to start building us and ministering to us what it is that he has set us apart to fulfill. He will also enable us to fulfill that role through gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those gifts, contrary to what you learned in counterfeit Christianity, are given for the common good, and they are given to each. That's what Paul says. They are given to each according to what God has set them apart to do. If you don't know the purpose for which God is built has, you know, has set you apart to fulfill, you need to receive that from him. If you do not have gifts, you have not clearly been told by God what your gifts are. He has not built that in you. Then you need to receive that from him. You need to know that that has to happen in order for you to fulfill your covenant. Do not be deceived. This is not the responsibility of Jews It's not the responsibility of pastors. It's not just the responsibility of his servants. It is the responsibility of every single person in the body of Christ. The reason I say it like that is because counterfeit Christianity has a habit habit of separating Christians and Jews by responsibility. But the word 
actually gives more responsibility to Christians because they're supposed to know better. From the time that Christ came and ministered, the fact that we have the new covenant, we have the, the New Testament, we have more responsibility on us than the Jews of the Old Testament ever had. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he requires everyone everywhere to repent. First fruits are the witnesses, the apostles, and Jesus. They are also represented in the early harvest, which occurs in spring. They are also represented in grain, in bread, unleavened bread representing Christ. You will never have unleavened bread representing any other person. It only represents Christ because he is the only one who was sinless and blameless. In the festival of weeks, you're going to see a very specific recipe for the bread that represents the witnesses and the apostles. That bread contains two tenths of an ephah of flour. Two tenths when reduced is one fifth. One fifth is the value that was added to anything that was to be redeemed. Obviously, Christ didn't need to be redeemed. We sold ourselves into slavery through our sin, and therefore we needed to be redeemed. The bread that represents the festival of weeks, the witnesses and the apostles, also contains yeast. Yeast represents sin. That's the reason Jesus, the bread that represents Jesus, does not have any yeast. Now, does this mean that Christ, that God is saying, oh, don't worry, you're going to be redeemed and you have sin, no biggie, Christ paid it all? Nope. You see what the witnesses and the apostles do. You see the cost. It's going to cost them, well, it's already cost the apostles their life. It is going to cost the witnesses their life. There is a huge mantle on them. So let's not be silly. Verse 15. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought... Oh, we, I wanted to talk with you about the Sabbath. So what Sabbath are we talking about? We're talking about the Sabbath that follows Passover. We couldn't possibly be talking about the Sabbath before Passover. And we couldn't be talking about the Sabbath that follows Passover. Because if you're eating grain already during Passover and the festival of unleavened bread, then that doesn't make any sense. So it's got to be the Sabbath after Passover. That means the festival of unleavened bread is part of Passover. So let's look at a calendar. The festival of unleavened bread ended on the 13th of April. So what is the day after Sabbath? Well, let's look at where Sabbath is. Sabbath would be the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 15th. And so the day after Sabbath would be the evening of the 15th until the evening of the 16th. So let's just, to make it easy, we're going to start with the 16th and we're going to count and we're just going to remember that we got to include that eve of the day before when we get to the end of that. Remember, and for those of you who are new to this, God's days begin in the evening. They don't begin in the morning, like in the Gregorian calendar. All right, so we're gonna start with the 16th of April and going back to Leviticus, it's going to tell us how to count. So speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm sorry, I should have gone to the festival of weeks. Verse 15, from the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave, wave offering, count off seven full weeks. So 50 days, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. Let me ask you something. If we start on the day after the Sabbath, what day will we end with if we, start, if we count 50 days? We start on a Sunday. What day are we going to end with? We're going to end with a Sunday. That's 50 days later. I mentioned to you in another video that... There were two options of online when I looked at when is, uh, when is Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot. One option was May 28th, and the other option was May 25th. May 25th is a Thursday. Does that automatically rule that out? That's what Reform Judaism says, that that's when Shavuot is. It's a lie. It's false. How can they justify that? First of all, how do they justify... Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, ever being on a Thursday. The word says 
it's the day after the Sabbath. That you're counting 50 days from the day after the Sabbath. There's no way that you could ever end up on any other day but the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. It's lunacy. Like, how do you change that when it's so clearly written in the word? The other option was May 28th, but I'm going to show you that that's also false. So where did we say we're starting? The 13th was the last day of the Passover, of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. That was when we had our Passover assembly. The next Sabbath is the 14th through the 15th. And the day after the Sabbath is the 15th through the 16th. So we're going to start with the 16th. Like I said, when we get to the end of the 50 days, we're just going to remember that the day starts that e- with the eve before. Okay? So 16, 16th through the 23rd, one week. 23rd to the 30th, two weeks. To the 7th, three weeks. To the uh, 14th, four weeks. To the 21st, five weeks, to the 28th, six weeks, and to the 4th of June. That's seven weeks. What did he say? Count off seven weeks. So we have the 4th of June with the eve of the 3rd starting that day, right? The evening of the 3rd of June until the eve of the 4th of June. That is Pentecost. That is the Feast of Weeks. The 28th would be six weeks. So that is exactly 50 days from the day after the Sabbath, the the first Sabbath after uh, Passover. Why are they messing with this? Why is something messing with this, with God's holy days? Because that's what the Antichrist does. We've already been told that that the Antichrist is going to attempt to change his appointed times, God's appointed times. Must be pretty important if he's gone to all this effort, huh? So verse 16, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made with two tenths of an ephah of the finest flour baked with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. So they're even, the priest is even waving this bread that represents the apostles and the witnesses. And two loaves, notice that there's two loaves, the apostles and the witnesses. Present this bread with this bread, seven male lambs, each a year old without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, a food offering and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, and then by the way, uh, when the witnesses are spoken of in Revelation 14, they are described as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Here you see similar language. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. Okay? Who's the Lord? God and the Lamb. On that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. That's clear, by the way. This is to be a lasting ordinance, number one. For generations to come, number two, wherever you live, number three. Okay, so that is the first day of Pentecost. That's the first day of the Festival of Weeks. And that should be an assembly. So I'm putting on my calendar, and this is going to be a Sunday. I'm putting on my calendar Sunday the 4th, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, that we are having an assembly. All of you are invited. I will put the link in the description box for you. 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on June 4th. That's going to be the first assembly of Pentecost. And all you need to do is take that link, plug it into your browser, type in your name, make sure that there is a slash through the camera because we don't use camera. Make sure there's not a slash through the microphone. Type in your name and join the meeting. That's all you have to do. Everyone uses the same link. Verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. 
Leave them for the poor and the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And this is the last festival of the early harvest season, of the spring harvest season. So you're going to notice that the very next festival is the festival of trumpets, and that does not occur until autumn. It will occur on Ethanim 1. I'm going to continue reading to you about Pentecost, talking with you about Pentecost, but I want us to keep in mind, I had kind of hesitated on doing that because I didn't want to take away from second Passover. I want us to keep holding that and keep being in that spirit of unity and support for those who are entering into this uh, Passover for the first time, who have made themselves ready to enter into the second Passover, I want us to keep holding that open, you know, holding that for them and being excited with them. So I might kind of space this out a little bit, but I wanted to give you, uh, uh, just kind of get you also in the mood to be looking toward Pentecost as well and understanding what this season is all about. This season, this spring season is all about the first fruits, all about those who are going to die first and those who are first fruits to God and the Lamb. What they're doing right now, what this season is all about and what you yourselves need to be preparing for and utilizing while the witnesses are here, while they are testifying and while they are preparing the next remnant, which hopefully is you. Hopefully you are part of that remnant because that's the only other remnant that's going to be saved and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So we'll keep talking about this. Look for that, the instructions in the description box with the link. Make sure that you copy and paste that somewhere or remember to go back to this video. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.